Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Swanson. I'm an engineer at Netflix um, in encoding technology, specifically the video algorithms team. Um, I'm talking to you today uh, with one of my colleagues, uh, Mariana Fonzo, basically about how Netflix does things with respect to um, video compression and also some important challenges we feel still exist uh, in, the world, in the video compression world. Um, I'm going to let Mariana introduce herself, and then we'll get into the presentation. Hello, my name is Mariana Fonso. I'm a research scientist working in the codec team at Netflix. So uh, one of the questions that people still ask, uh, specifically about video compression, uh, is usually, is improving video compression still relevant? Um, and if you look in the upper left corner of this screen, hopefully you see some encoding artifacts. Uh, when the sun rises over the earth, uh, up there, you see a, a, a quite a bit of banding artifacts. Um, this is something that you wouldn't see in real life, hopefully. I don't know, I don't wake up that early. Uh, but this is a, a type of encoding artifact that is kind of sadly something that um, you see over and over again every day, you know, as you're looking at compressed images and videos. Um, but besides these annoying encoding artifacts, um, the reasons why video compression are still relevant is one, video uh, traffic is increasing uh, actually at a pretty rapid pace, especially during the last year. Um, varying bandwidth availability is a problem. Not everybody has a robust network. Uh, some people are on cellular or LTE connections where um, not only may it be slower, it might be um, inconsistent. Um, a lot of people have higher quality expectations in their video now. Uh, Dolby Vision on a, on a 4K OLED is a lot different than uh, a DVD on a CRT that needs a conversion adjustment. Um, and on top of all that, uh, there's lots of new and uh, different immersive content types that we're seeing. Um, so hopefully you can see in this example, uh, it, it should show through the slides. Um, this is sort of a demonstration of the trade-offs that are involved, involved in video compression. Um, you can have a very low bit rate, and that's what you see on the, the far left. And if you swing all the way to the far right, you see um, pretty much very high quality. Um, it's, it's possible to, to encode something with either of those, um, but it's hard and kind of impossible to, to have, have it both ways. It's, uh, there's a trade-off involved, definitely, and that's kind of what we're in the business of doing, um, identifying those trade-offs and sort of managing um, where, uh, wh what kind of operating points we want to be operating at. at. So video is uh, especially uh, 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 big data. So this, this show, when they see us, when the studio delivered this to us, uh, it was 400 gigabytes of mastered video per episode. Uh, the bit rate uh, is 950 megabits per second. Um, so that's huge. Video is huge. It's, a, it's enormous data. Um, when we go and make the encodes for this video and stream it to you, um, we'll probably uh, have a bit rate something four, five megabits per second. So that's roughly a compression ratio of, um, let's say, 99.5%. So that's a, a huge compression ratio. And we're still uh, making sure that once we encode it, it looks great. So that's kind of the problem. Um, so here's our agenda for this talk. Um, I'll touch on these first two topics, and then we'll hand over to Mariana, and she'll talk about the second two. So the very first thing, uh, just for context, we'll talk about the Netflix encoding pipeline. And uh, this is the Netflix encoding pipeline. This is us. This is our small team of engineers. Um, we have people here who work directly on the codex. We have people here who work on the video quality metrics. We have people here who um, are more focused on sort of the nuts and bolts of encoding. Um, so we're the people who are obsessed with getting this right, and we're the people who um, really take the time and uh, energy to figure out these problems. Um, another contact slide. So um, the way that we do video streaming and video encoding uh, at Netflix, it's not a um, frames in, bit streams out, one-to-one -one sort of thing. We stream using something called HTTP adaptive streaming. Um, and basically what that is, is we provide the exact same content at a variety of resolutions and bit rates. I'm kind of in this matrix that you see here. 
And the reason that we do that is um, to give the client, uh, uh, whoever's playing back the, the streams, um, options when it, when it comes time to download and stream these. Um, the, the decision uh, on the client side is usually made to avoid rebuffering, for example. And that decision is usually informed by, by the size of these chunks that they need to download, um, the bandwidth that the client might have available at that specific time, um, and maybe the buffer that the, that the client maintains. So um, maybe you're uh, on your cell phone and you're on a train going through a tunnel. You may want to dip down to a lower bit rate to make sure you don't rebu rebuffer. And then as soon as you get to the other side of the tunnel, uh, you have more bandwidth and you can go, go up uh, in bit rate. Um, so just to, just to sort of show some visual examples here of, of uh, video quality and, and uh, bit rate, uh, we have this slide here, which is, this is like a, a piece of 2D animation, pretty simple content. There's not any um, extreme textures or anything in here. And this is what it looks like at 1080p when we encode it at 1050 kilobits per second. Um, there's not really any encoding distortion in this picture that I can see. Um, it looks perfectly fine. I think most people would be perfectly happy watching a, a stream of this quality. Um, now here's another piece of content, uh, same bit rate, 1050 kilobits per second. Um, and it's actually kind of hard to tell what's going on here. It's full of distortion. Um, Seems like there's maybe some smoke or something in the foreground, but all I really see is macro blocks. Um, this is kind of horrific, um, actually. Um, if, if you were to try to watch this, you'd probably get annoyed and turn it off. Um, again, back to the 2D animation, same bit rate, 1050. Um, let's bump it up. Same exact frame, encoded at 5,800 kilobits per second. And if I kind of toggle between the two here, uh, hopefully it's evident that there's basically no difference between these in terms of uh, its video quality. Back to the action scene, original bit rate, 1050 kilobits per second, uh, up to 5800 again. And if I toggle between these two, uh, it goes from a blurry, blocky, distorted mess to something that would actually be pleasant to watch. So hopefully this convinces you that it's not enough to build a bitrate ladder using fixed bit, bit rates. That's not like um, the most elegant or even efficient way to solve this problem. Um, and video quality in the context of encoding distortions is extremely content dependent, uh, meaning simple content is going to look great at, at, a, at a low bit rate and complex content, meaning high motion, fine textures, film grain is going to look pretty bad at that bit rate. So if, if this is how you want to approach building your bitrate ladder uh, using fixed bit rates, um, it means kind of that you're going to need to solve for the worst case. Uh, so in this example, all your bitrate ladders would top out at 5,800 kilobits per second. And the result of that is everything looks great. Everything looks okay. Um, but you're being very wasteful uh, with the bitrate and bandwidth for the content that doesn't need um, all those extra bits. So the solution to this problem and the way that we've approached it um, is something we call content, content adaptive encoding. Um, and basically what that is, is you search and probe the input signal. Um, you may do some complexity analysis on it, make some measurements. And based on uh, the information that you get from the complexity analysis stage, you use that to um, tune your encoder, select your encoding parameters to maximize video quality, while you minimize the bit rate. Um, so when we first started doing this, we started with something called per title encoding. And basically it's exactly what I just described um, on a, on a, on a um, video by video basis, meaning like an episode or a, a movie, we would scan the whole thing, we would make some complexity measurements and we would set the encoding parameters and the bit rate ladder um, sort of configuration for that whole movie. And after we did that, uh, not, not too, uh, too far after, um, we, we came up with something called um, shot-based encoding. So just like different content can vary in its complexity, um, it's a pretty reasonable to, assumption to sort of make that jump to the shot-by-shot-by-shot-by-shot shot shot basis. Um, you may have some shots in the same title, which you know, is a close-up of someone's face. And, uh, and then the very next shot is this um, 
action scene that we saw earlier. So the face would get uh, uh, maybe a less aggressive uh, bit rate, um, and then you would you would spend those bits on on the scenes that actually needed them. So this is a really powerful concept, actually. So the scene is the unit of uh, encoding and optimization. This means that every single uh, encode unit chunk is one GOP. And it consists of one IDR frame, and then every other frame in that GOP is a reference frame. So we're right away we're minimizing the use of the most expensive frame type, which is the IDR. Um, and then by probing and measuring the shot, doing the complexity analysis, as I mentioned, um, on the shot-by-shot -shot basis, we end up having extremely fine control over the specific encoding parameters uh, used per shot. So we have um, complete control over the rate control, we'll say, um, of the video by modulating something, uh, in something like QP or CRF on, on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. Um, and we sort of pack that all together in this framework, which we've, we've called the dynamic optimizer. And basically how this works is we get, uh, we get a movie, we run the whole thing through scene detection. Um, we chunk the movie according to the scene boundaries. We do a complexity analysis on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. Um, and then we optimize for an objective, which is going to be video quality while minimizing bitrate. So after this is all said and done, we end up with something that is looks as good as it can according to our video quality metric for as, as cheap as possible. And when I say cheap, I mean lowest bit rate. So this has um, been very successful for us. Uh, we've reduced bit rates and improved quality pretty dramatically uh, since this has gone online. Um, there are open problems here still. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, problem when you start to think about the, uh, the complexity of the, comp uh, the encoding complexity or the CPU complexity of that, this complexity analysis uh, stage that I was talking about. Obviously, this is not something you want to brute force, meaning every shot we encode at every QP, for example. Um, that's wasteful. It's, it's um, not efficient. So you start to get into different techniques, like um, subsampling the QPs, interpolation, uh, or even predictive methods using models. Um, so that's that's um, this is this is one of the challenges I think this is one of the exciting challenges that we have to to bring this forward, um, and basically if you're using a regression or a prediction method, uh, you need to figure out how to balance your prediction error with sort of overall compression uh, uh, performance, um, and and since we've introduced this this framework we've sort of halved and halved again the the um, CPU complexity of, of this uh, type of encoding, but still, uh, it's an open era, area of research for us, I would say. Um, so once we build the, the bitrate ladders, uh, it comes time to select the optimal streams, um, basically. And again, this is adaptive bitrate, uh, uh, adaptive streaming, this is kind of what it looks like. So in this example, we have a bitrate ladder that has a low quality, a medium quality, and a high quality. And this dotted line is sort of the trace that goes through um, you know, this ladder as, as someone plays it. So the resulting playback is you start low, you get a little bit more bandwidth, uh, and then you can build up to that high bit rate. Um, this is a pretty normal uh, thing to see. Um, if you sort of take a slice of this bit rate ladder and sort of plot it in the bit rate quality space, you get what is known as an RD curve. and um, this is what we use when we're selecting the operating points um, on our bitrate ladder. So the way that this works is um, we get this RD curve, as you've seen, but the way that we build that RD curve is we take each one of these resolutions. So this is the RD curve of the low resolution. This is the RD curve of the mid resolution. And this is the RD curve of the high re resolution. And if you superimpose all of those on top of one another, you get what is pretty much a um, a Pareto front or a convex hull, as we call it. And if you filter out all these points that are non-convex or non-optimal, you end up with this um, RD curve. And, and from that RD curve, uh, you can select your operating points. So uh, 
there are other things that, that one could do in encoding um, to get more gains. So once you get to the fine level of control of DO, where you basically um, have control over everything, um, there are, there are um, different interesting areas of research um, that you can go to try to squeak out a little bit more visual quality um, and maybe reduce bitrate a little bit more. So one of the things that we'll be talking about at PCS is this deep down sampler. And what this is basically is a CNN down sampler and it's trained on this um, down sample encode uh, up sample use case. Um, and again, this is a this is a content adaptive technique. A traditional down sample like Langsos, for example, um, is sort of a one size fits all approach, whereas this um, is is content adaptive. Uh, the downscaling uh, is done according to uh, the input signal. Okay, so video quality. I've kind of hand waved over this so far. I just called it video quality, um, but we do have an actual objective metric quantitative metric that we use um, for encoding optimization. And, and uh, what that is, is called VMAF. So the questions that we ask ourselves um, about video quality is, if, if, if a Netflix member were to watch this video, how would they rate the quality of the video? Would they say it's poor, average, excellent? Um, if we were doing codec comparisons, you know, we would, we'd say, which video clip looks better? Is it the, the, the clip that's encoded with codec A, or is it the clip that's encoded with codec B? Um, again, scaling algorithms, um, you know, not only do we encode stuff, we also downscale and upscale. Um, there's, there's a certain amount of distortion in, in that sort of process. So what's a better, what's a better um, downscaling? Is it Lanxos or is it something neural network based, like super resolution? Um, for a specific bit rate, like let's say uh, a, a thousand kilobits per second, uh, is, it, is it better to encode with an HD resolution with some blockiness? Or will an SD resolution that um, you know is has less blockiness but may have more um, upscaling artifacts look better? So that's that's what VMAF is. VMAF is uh, our metric. It's um, a, a measure of human perceived video quality um, in the presence of encoding artifacts. And uh, encoding artifacts really means compression artifacts. These are artifacts um, that are caused by the the codec, like uh, quantization, uh, etc and scaling artifacts. Those two things combined is what VMAF is trying to, to measure. So VMAF is a um, full reference metric, meaning it's an algorithm and you hand to it your reference picture or video and your distorted video. And it, it uh, runs through there and it'll come back to you with a video quality score. And this video quality score is on a scale of one or zero to a hundred. Um, so VMAF is meant to be robust. It predicts subjective quality uh, consistently across resolutions, scenes, and genres. And you can kind of see an example of that in this picture. Um, so how does VMAF work? So basically what it is, is it's a, a fusion. So we um, extract several elementary features um, from the pixel domain, from the reference and distorted pair. And we use that those features to tr train with subjective data. So um, it's been a series of subjective tests where, where um, subjective viewers have watched and rated videos. And we use that data to train an SVM to use these features to come up with a VMAF score. So um, one of the most um, important uses uh, at, at Netflix, especially for the encoding team, is using it to guide in encoding decisions, uh, like I said, with, uh, with DO. Um, so VMAP has a software implementation and it's been open source um, since day one, actually. So if you want to try it, um, you can go find it here on GitHub. Um, if you ha haven't been keeping score at home, uh, we, we just had a VMAP uh, 2.0 API release um, in the last few months. Um, and we've we've gone from something that worked well to something that works um, extremely well for uh, several use cases, um, including putting VMAF in in your encoding loop. If you wanted to, um, you know, write something that sort of fused the quality metric and, and the encoder, we have a library that supports that. Um, 
Another thing that's really kind of fun and interesting is uh, we did some work on this software and uh, along with Intel and Facebook, I should say, um, we first rewrote these feature extractors that I was talking about um, in, in fixed point using fixed point uh, arithmetic. And then we uh, put some optimizations, x86 optimizations on top of there, specifically with AVX2 and AVX512. Um, and as a result, uh, VMAP is over twice as fast as it was last year. Um, so it's even more usable. Um, we've also uh, updated the, the software license. Uh, it's, it's BSD plus patent now. Um, this, this, this license is meant to be extremely um, uh, uh, useful, uh, especially for every, everybody in the industry, but also open source multimedia. It, it works really well with um, the, the tools and software that we have out there already. Um, another interesting thing inside BMAF is this new mode that we've put in it, specifically uh, developed for codec ev evaluation, and uh, we're calling it BMAF NEG, which stands for No Enhancement Gain. And what this is meant to do is measure the, the gain um, from compression and try to ignore the gain um, that one might get by pre-processing their video with something like sharpening. Um, so the, the standard VMAF model, it captures perceptual gain from image enhancement. So it's true that if you sharpen an image, for example, uh, one form of pre-processing, and then encode it, perceptually it's probably going to look better to you than just um, you know, the standard image uh, with encoding distortion. Um, and we actually saw people take advantage of this. So libAOM, uh, the AV1 encoder, put in a mode uh, a few months back called Tune VMAF, where kind of in the loop, they use the Live VMAF to um, sharpen, uh, do some pre-processing on the picture before it was encoded. And you'll see here the scores down here. Um, with this Tune VMAF, they were able to um, boost that VMAF score. And the picture, you know, it looks OK. It looks maybe a little bit better. Um, but, but definitely, the VMAF score is being boosted there. Um, and here's a diff of sort of the original encoding versus the tune VMAP encoding. And you can really see what they've done there. Um, there's some edge sharpening happening um, along the, the head and torso. Um, so while this is an important factor of VMAP, we want VMAP to capture this. We also want to use VMAP in another context, which is codec evaluation. Um, if you have a pair of codecs that you're shooting out or you want to evaluate a certain codec, especially if it's a black box encoder, meaning it um, it's a, comes from a vendor and it's a proprietary encoder and you can't go look and see what it's doing like, like lib, uh, libAOM. Um, it's, an, it's, it's interesting to have this sort of mode in VMAF that sort of tries to cancel out that enhancement gain. So uh, VMAF NEG. So our position about the two is there is value to disregard the enhancement gain that is not a part of the codec, specifically for the um, codec testing but it's also valuable to preserve that enhancement gain um, to reflect the quality perceived by, by users. So the solution was this, to this was introduce these two new modes. So we have the standard VMAF model and we have the VMAF NEG model. And the proposal is use the NEG model for codec evaluation and use the default model to assess compression and enhancement combined. Um, and this tool with VMAF um, is being used in AOM uh, as the standard metrics implementation for their CTC. Um, and they're actually using both of these metrics. Uh, that, uh, they are interested in, in seeing how both of these metrics um, work uh, uh, as they're introducing new tools and encoding types of encoding distortion. Um, so VMAP is great. It, it works really well. Um, it is our optimization objective, as I said, for all of our encoding. But it's not perfect like almost everything in life. There are current cases where it fails to predict quality. Um, so this is really another open question, uh, another area of research to identify when the objective quality metrics fail and to prevent the visual artifacts from showing up during the encoding process. And just kind of a quick visual example of what that looks like is, hopefully this comes through on the slides, but um, you see here we have an increase in VMAF. But the texture of this roof um, I would say it looks worse. So this, this is an example of a corner case. And if you find more corner cases, um, please submit them. If you go to the, the VMAF README, there's a form to submit them. 
Um, and this is, this is useful information for us because we're interested in making this metric better. Um, yes. Okay, I am going to hand off to Mariana now. Uh, she will talk about banding artifacts, and then uh, she has a couple other topics as well. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so one of the most visually annoying types of artifacts which can be introduced by the encoding process are banding artifacts, which are characterized as false contouring in regions with small intensity gradients. Um, so this type of artifact are not usually captured by most video quality metrics such as PSNR or even VMAF. Um, in the example in this slide, uh, we can see a sunset shot uh, where they're clear banding artifacts, although they might not be visible on your screen. Um, VMAF is, for this scene, is around 86 and PSNR is 50 dBs. Um, however, the visual um, score that I would give for this um, scene is, is nowhere near these numbers. In the next slide, we have introduced artificial colors for each of the bands. So here you can clearly see um, that there is a huge problem in this scene. Um, where we can clearly see the bands of the of the sun. Um, given that VMAF does not currently capture this type of artifact, we have been working on a banding detection index. We have named this detector uh, CAMBI, which stands for uh, Contrast Aware Multi-Scale Banding Index. I won't go into too many details about the algorithm in this presentation, but it is a subjectively motivated a multi-scale algorithm that takes um, inputs with multiple bit depths, including 8-bit and 10-bit um, inputs, and is also able to handle images with spatial dittering. Uh, another advantage of CAMBI is that it has very few hyperparameters, so it's less likely to be overfit to a data set, um, and we hope to open source CAMBI uh, very soon, so look out for that. If you want to know more details about CAMBI, you can find details in our uh, PCS paper that was actually presented uh, earlier this morning. Um, based on a data set that we collected of 86 videos with 23 subjects, um, we have plotted the CAMBI scores, the VMAF scores, and the PSNR scores here in the slide against the mean opinion scores. And we can see that um, CAMBI is unlike um, VMAF and PSNR, which are nowhere correlated with uh, the subjective scores. CAMBI is highly correlated with the annoyance caused by the presence of banding. And in terms of the correlation coefficients, we can see that um, CAMBI has a really high correlation of over 0 0.9, um, whereas VMAF and PSNR show very little. Uh, to no correlation. Um, <clears throat> CAMBI is not the only banding detection algorithm out there. We've compared CAMBI to uh, two other detectors that have actually been open sourced recently, and those algorithms are BBAND and DBI, um, using the same data set that we presented before. And we can see in these figures that uh, CAMBI is able to outperform these two other algorithms, which is for this data set, which is an encouraging result uh, for CAMBI. And, um, but we're really excited to see other research in this area, and we're also open for collaborations. Moving on to video standards at Netflix. Netflix members uh, watch your content in a hugely diverse set of devices around the world. Um, you can imagine that people are watching on smartphones, browsers, and also in their living rooms on smart TVs. As the encoding team, our job is to produce streams to support all of these devices and all of these use cases that um, our members watch. And this means that we have to maintain a number of codecs in the service. Um, so innovations in compression efficiency including new standards that um, show up in, in terms of the codex, have potential to translate into hugely better experiences for our members, which means less free buffers, better video quality, um, more uh, data, more videos if you have data caps. Uh, for this reason, we have 
always moved quickly in adopting newer standards. However, as we are going to learn um, later in this presentation, this uh, process of productizing a new codec is not um, easy and it depends on many external factors. As founding members of the Alliance for Open Media, or AOM, which um, is a community that uh, aims at developing royalty-free codecs, one of the standardization efforts that we have actively participated on and supported is AV1, which was, uh, the specification was finalized in 2018. Our team has actively contributed to the AV1 development um, in a number of different areas, including providing a source material from our catalog um, on developing the normative film grain tool and also working on the decoder model. Even though the specification for AV1 is finalized since 2018, uh, the encoders for AV1 can keep on improving, both in terms of compression efficiency, but also in terms of uh, speed. Um, on this end, another project that we have worked on um, is SVT AV1 um, together with Intel. The goal of this project was to increase AV1 adoption and also to provide a platform for experimentation and research. So even though we can develop more and more optimized encoders, devices need to be capable of decoding AV1. So although not as ubiquitous as H.264, a number of browsers already support AV1, and these include Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. Um, in terms of mobile devices, recently um, later uh, latest Android version already has AV1 support, while in iOS it's currently lacking. Um, in terms of OTT devices, some recent models uh, already come with AV1 support, and we expect manufacturers to add this um, to more and more devices in the near future. So early last year, we announced that we started streaming AV1 to some Android devices in our tech blog. Um, you can look at our tech blog as well from February 2020. For this launch, we leveraged the great performance of David, which is a software decoder, and it was developed by several companies, including Videoland, Tutorials, um, and by the contribution of many in the open source multimedia community, and also for some AOM members. So we've also been partnering with uh, Facebook to sponsor some improvements um, to David to make it even faster. So with regard to the types of content that can be found in our catalog, unlike other companies that work with a user-generated video, for instance, our content is mostly pristine and it's coming from the studios. So with this in mind, the majority of sources are actually high bit depth. Um, so encoding and uh, using codecs such as H.264 or VP9 in the main profile requires a conversion to 8-bit which um, could introduce banding artifacts and also make banding artifacts worse. So one big advantage of AV1 is that um, 10 bit is readily supported in the main profile, which means that we're likely, we're less likely to see these sorts of artifacts as long as clients can display the content properly. Another aspect of our content is the use of film grain in many of our titles. And this sometimes is artificially introduced for creative intent. And one of the goals of our team is to preserve creative intent in the encoding process. And um, one of the highlights of AV1 is actually the availability of a normative uh, film grain synthesis tool, uh, which can be leveraged to help preserve this noise instead of uh, it being removed by the compression process. However, um, many, uh, there are many open challenges related to film grain. The first one uh, relates to film grain, how to handle film grain using uh, legacy codecs that do not have this mandatory um, tool to synthesize film grain. And um, how do we actually do the coding of the grain in an efficient manner? And then the second is um, for AV1, for instance, where we have this um, tool. How do we actually measure the um, quality of the video with synthesized grain so that we can make the encoding decisions in our pipeline? So with regards to performance of AV1 compared to its predecessors, 
uh, we did some experiments and this one was done in October 2019 with a number of our 1080p titles. Uh, we compared um, H.264 using H.264 encoder, VP9 using libvpx, and AV1 using libaom. And these encodes were per shot optimized um, and film grain was disabled for AV1. Um, and these are the, on the right, you can see the average results for all of these 1080p titles. On average, uh, VP9 achieved over 18% uh, savings over H.264, and AV1 achieved um, almost 40% savings over H.264, which are, which are really encouraging results for AV1. On the left, we can see the rate distortion curve, and AV1 is in green. Um, we can see that this is um, a really big improvement for AV1 compared to, especially to H.264 on the right. Since we announced the launch of AV1 streams in our service last year, for some Android devices, we've been trying to really expand um, the reach of this codec uh, by uh, doing several things. The first one is testing additional clients, um, both using hardware and software decoding solutions. The next one is to expand our catalog coverage for this codec. And then we're also working on improving our encoding strategies specifically for AV1. And at the same time, we've been sponsoring projects um, with David um, and then some very exciting work on uh, SCUDA-based uh, AV1 decoding in partnership with other companies. The ultimate goal is to extend our AV1 streaming coverage for the coming years. The reality is that productizing a new codec is extremely challenging and depends on many internal and external factors. Uh, on the client side, as we mentioned before, critical decoder support is really required, but also um, we need to certify streams for specific devices, and this includes the codec and also encoder settings. And um, for the case of, in addition, we need to encode the catalog to produce these video streams. And in the case of AV1, although encoders are getting faster and faster, this is still a computationally expensive effort um, in the part of encoding. And then finally, we also need to consider how these streams will affect our content delivery network as they need to coexist with the other representations targeted for other devices or use cases. In addition to video, our catalog also contains lots and lots of artwork in our UI. Um, this is in the dust. This is really important to provide also an efficient image codec uh, that will be able to help us um, improve our UI. On this matter, AOM has also standardized AVIF, which stands for um, AV1 Image File Format, which is a container format um, that carries AV1 intercoded images which are actually more efficient than HEVC uh, intercoding and has some notable features, including lossless alpha coding, built-in animations, and HDR metadata. In terms of compression efficiency, AV1 Intra is over, from our measurements, AV1 Intra is over 60% more efficient than JPEG. And for more information on this topic, you can check out our tech blog on AVIF. Finally, we reached the last section of this workshop, which concerns uh, the next generation of codecs beyond AV1. Since the start of digital video, several codecs have been developed by a number of standard bodies. Some of the recent and notable examples include HEVC, VP9, AV1, and VVC. Typically, one generation of standards, from one generation of standards to the next, the goal has always been to increase the compression efficiency by around 50%, using up to 10 times encoding complexity and two times decoding complexity. So earlier this year, AOM has announced that it started its efforts towards the research um, of tools beyond AV1. However, achieving 50% gain with low complexity is getting harder and harder. Each new standard introduces a number of additional tools, which means a much larger encoder search space, leading to a really asymmetric um, encoding versus decoding complexities. So some of the current challenges for the next generation of codecs are therefore finding those breakthrough 
technologies that will be able to significantly improve the efficiency while keeping complexity low. Um, and then in terms of the encoders, um, also finding a way to solve the encoder search problem, given that we have this huge amount of tools. And on the decoder side, um, if a tool is too complex or if a codec is too complex, um, software decoders, for instance, might only be able to support lower resolutions, which is not ideal. Given this investigation effort beyond AV1 has just started this year, this is a great opportunity for innovative research and collaboration between companies and academia. So if you have great ideas, it's a great time to start participating in this research. So some potential great areas for research that will be useful for our use case would be to improve, for instance, intracoding to provide more efficient uh, keyframes, um, also improved coding of residuals in terms of better strategies for quantization, multiple transforms. Um, and then of course, one of the uh, most popular topics in academia, neural networks, um, would be to propose neural network-based tools which can be really applied to almost any stage in a hybrid video codec. The challenge here is how to design a tool that is lightweight enough um, to be in a standard um, and to be in the decoder, but it's still able to provide the necessary gains. Then of course, tools that can be related to um, our type of content um, would be um, improving the film grain synthesis algorithms, also, um, the in-loop resolution adaptation that is already part of AV1, um, improving that would be a, a great effort towards the codecs beyond AV1. And it also, it might be useful for adaptive streaming scenarios. Um, also, tools designed to improve the efficiency of artificial content, such as animations, HDR-specific tools, and finally, ways to reduce or mitigate banding artifacts. If you're interested in doing great research, there are several options for contribution. Uh, for academic groups, the most practical option might be to participate in a research project with one of the AOM member companies. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at PCS2021 um, at netflix.com. We'll be happy to receive your emails and your questions. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll be happy to answer any Q&As.